Okay, I'm starting the show super early today because I am so excited for my guest. And thank you so much for watching. If you are tuning in, we super appreciate it. Thank you for all the subscribing. Lately, we've got tons more subscribers and it just makes my heart happy that people want to talk about this stuff because I want to talk about this stuff and let's all talk about this stuff because it's fabulous. The voice is so super cool. Um, today's guest is one of my bucket list people. Um, I have fallen asleep to many of his audiobooks, but not because they were boring, because I was listening to them till the wee hours of the morning and they are just fabulous. So let me tell you a bit about Jeff. We'll bring him on. You can ask your questions. You can pop them in the chat. I've got tons of questions for him. So if you have nothing, I've got lots. So we will have a in-depth conversation no matter what. Um, so Jeff, let's read his official bio. We'll bring him on and we'll get it going. So Jeff Goins helps creative people succeed through his best-selling books, courses, coaching, and speeches. He shares his ongoing journey of transformation, inspiring creators like you to discover your voice and share it with the world. See, uh, He is also the founder of Fresh Complaint, a bespoke creative agency that helps thought leaders turn good ideas into big ideas. Jeff and his team do this through the powerful medium of books, from proposals to editing to full-on ghostwriting. Fresh Complaint can help you make your book great. Um, just outside of Nashville, Jeff can be found making a midday omelet for a friend, hiking with his kids, or editing his latest poem. Come on in, Jeff. Welcome. Hi, Jill. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, but it's entirely my pleasure. And this is totally off topic, but tell me about omelets, because that is intriguing to me that that made the bio. So are you some kind of a chef? What's going on? I wrote that bio in, in 2020. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was pretty, uh, I lived in an apartment at the time. It was pretty normal for me to invite somebody over uh, yeah. and and cook for them. Uh, I did get back into cooking um, in uh, in 2020. It was one of, one of mm -hmm. my uh, escapes. Uh, my dad is a cook and uh, started a couple of restaurants, mm -hmm. and I think I just picked up a lot from him. Of I love food; I've always enjoyed cooking, but you know, um, uh, I, I don't know that I ever considered myself a, a cook, even though it was my first job in high school, is working in a kitchen. Uh, and I just kind of like got super into cooking in 2019, 2020, and beyond. And um, I would rather spend two to three hours in the kitchen making a meal than. Mm -hmm and go out. Um, and an omelet, um, as any culinary person might know yes. is, is sort of like the chef's test for whether or not you're a good cook or not. Yeah. Um, because an all, making a great omelet is actually really, uh, difficult to perfect. It's easy to, to do moderately well. It's almost impossible to master. And, and that's, you know, there's a handful of, uh, chef's tests like that. That's one yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, and I lo I've always loved omelets and I, you know, got obsessed with trying to, you know, create the perfect omelet. Exactly. So if somebody comes over and, uh, and I offer to cook for them, many people yeah. eat eggs. I always have, uh, farm fresh eggs on hand. And so, I'll, you know, it was an easy thing to, to make for somebody. And there oh, was yeah. this, like, um, there was, I, for a while I made this like particular omelet that people really liked. And it was like, a uh, there was a bunch of variations of it, but it used pancetta. So it was like a pancetta omelet nice. with like Italian herbs and seasoning. So it was like this kind of Italian, yep. I called it an Italian omelet, which is delicious, which is not a thing, uh, but it, but, <laughs> but it should be, that, that was my thing. You know, omelets are oh. French, but I used Italian yes. seasonings. And so it was an Italian omelet. Oh, I love this. I, I think, uh, the pandemic got us, a, a lot of us cooking again, or sure. at least starting. And, yep. um, that, that totally makes sense to me. And I feel too, like the creative energy expands to places you might not think. Like if you are a creative, you probably like cooking to some degree because there's a lot of recipes and, you know, different spice combos that you can play with. So I, I'm right there with you on that. And I think that's super super rad what's the secret to the best omelet you've ever made what is it what are we watching for because i think i want to know this before we move on i mean i think uh, the secret to cooking a great omelet is the secret to cooking a great anything which is that which mm -hmm. is a series of secrets uh, mm -hmm. one you have to start with really great ingredients which is uh, everybody says but it is really really important and i i think um 
uh, the best chefs know how to get the best stuff from the best places. And so, you know, getting, uh, if possible, some local organic eggs, that's great. If not, just yeah. like, uh, get the best quality eggs you possibly can get. And, and there are, yeah. there are full of like good brands at like normal grocery stores that have, um, uh, great eggs. Uh, you can just, you know, Google top rated eggs and you'll find some good stuff. Um, but, um, you know, a, a great, a great omelet is, is three eggs, uh, no cheese, oh, um, no cheese. Okay. Yeah. If you're putting cheese in your omelet, um, uh, you're not cooking an omelet. I mean, you can put cheese in an ah, omelet, but a great ah. omelet is just eggs. I mean, that is a classic, you know, French omelet. So whip three eggs. Uh, secret one is great eggs. Secret two is pre-salt the, the eggs. Now there's yeah. some dispute in the, uh, community of chefs yes, about um, whether or not yeah. you you salt while you're cooking or before. I'm on the side of of, of um, beating your eggs, uh, doing a pinch or two of salt, uh, and letting it sit for about 15 minutes so the salt gets um, you know sort of uh, absorbed into the eggs. Uh, yeah. uh, Kenji Lopez, who runs the food lab, he says that um, you know salt is actually not an ingredient. It's not an herb. It's um, it's a mineral it, it, and so it chemically changes yeah. the substance of the food um and and so as soon as you put salt in something you're starting to sort of cook it in a way you're changing the oh right yeah, yeah so pre-salt yeah. your eggs let them sit for 15 minutes um and then uh you know kind of a standard omelet would be chives you know diced chives or green onion preferably chives and some fresh parsley mm -hmm. put that into the egg concoction uh uh you know heat up your your skillet your pan um, and, uh, butter. Uh, oh yeah. Lots, lots of butter. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. make sure the pan's not too hot. If you burn the butter, the butter turns brown. You got to toss it out, wipe it out. Wait a second. Try again. Um, yeah. cause if the butter's burnt, it's going to taste like burnt butter, which is not a terrible flavor, but it's not what you're going for. Not awesome. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and then, um, you know, the third, you know, pour your egg concoction in with lots of butter and then just keep it moving. You're almost making like scrambled eggs. Um, but, um, but you're not, you're not completely scrambling it. Um, but you're keeping it moving and then you, and you fold it sort of into thirds. So you're, so an omelet is not nice. folded. It's, it's rolled, rolled in, in, you know, to one, to one yeah. edge of the pan. Yeah. Um, and, and then, uh, the, the real secret is to not overcook it. Like an omelet should be That's a little fair. bit, like an omelet should be a little bit gooey in the middle. Um, the goo nice. is, is the, is the eggs. It's not the cheese and a little bit of butter. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the best omelet. I'm hungry. Yeah. It's the best omelet <laughs> I know how to make. And you could throw in some, some mushrooms or something. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's two chefs that I, you know, sort of subscribe to their methodology of cooking, uh, uh, omelets. One is Kenji Lopez, whom I mentioned, you can, mm -hmm. when I'm trying to learn something, I just literally Google food lab and whatever thing I'm trying to learn how to cook. Cause he usually has a recipe for it. Awesome. That is a great, great cookbook is food lab. And then, um, uh, there was a chef's table. Well, it was, it was chef. It was the, uh, it was the show. Oh yes. Yeah. It was just called chef that show. And, yep, um, yep. and they did one with, um, Wolfgang Puck. And Wolfgang Puck oh, that's right. uh, was like, you can't use a spatula, like a really good omelet. You, you either use like a, like a fork or you just like flip it with your hand. So, you know, those are two sort of sources to go to and, and watch and awesome. Yeah. But I love this. I love creatives because you never know um, what they're into outside of the thing that their like specialty zone of sure. genius is in. Right. And, and yeah. I find that we are passionate people about a lot of other things. And so I appreciate your omelet conversation because I am actually <laughs> going to go try that because yeah. I think if I can master an omelet, then the thing I actually want to do with my creative life is not so scary because I'm not talented at making omelets. Right. Yeah. So it's that confidence competence loop thing that we've got going on. I think that's brilliant. So um, yeah, I, I like love that. I, I like cooking because you never master it in the Ooh. same way that you don't like master the voice. You know, you can continue to nice. hone your instrument, work with your range and whatnot. Um, but I, I like cooking, not baking because it's forgiving, you. you know, for the most part, like yeah. if I'm making a bolognese sauce or something, I just yeah. keep throwing, if I mess up, I just throw more things in to fix it. Fix it. 
Yes, right. but you can't fix baking. Ugh. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I I want to be good at baking, but I just it's the finality of it all. It's just like totally. Oh. Um, yeah. nice segue to voice because that's what we're here to talk about. Um, and I just. I'm in love with your work. I'm in love with your website. The first line is stop being boring. And I just, I just fell in love. Um, so let's go back to, you know, the underlying connection between all of this, you know, best-selling author, podcast, blogger, marketer, speaker, all that good stuff. Singer. We'll talk about that later. Creator is the, is the theme through all of it. So I want to know about young Jeff when he was, dreaming of growing up and becoming something what did that journey look like for you what was that big dream and are you living it is really where i'm going with this but what was it um i mean when i was like six years old i think i wanted to be like rambo or something nice, uh, nice. um uh for for most of my life i've been a, like a sensitive creative person mm -hmm. Uh, and felt, you know, sort of misunderstood by the world. And I would retreat into stories and ideas and images as a way of making sense of the world. Uh, and, and the earliest creative pursuit I had was uh, art drawing. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in grade school, I, like every kid does, you know, I would, I would draw and I would kind of create these own little worlds and, and mimic and copy um, art that I liked, which was Garfield the Cat at the time. And, um, and, and, and I guess I was pretty good at it or I was interested mm -hmm. in it. My mom, uh, when I was in maybe fifth or sixth grade, signed me up for a, um, a college level art class, um, mm -hmm. or, or rather an art class that was being taught at the local university. And so I, I attended this like summer school thing, uh, at Northern Illinois university in Illinois. And, um, and I don't know, it was like a weekly Saturday class, like half day class, go there, you know, from nine to 12 or something. And it was mm -hmm. an art studio and we learned, you know, kind of like, I don't know, art one-on-one, uh, shading, perspective, lighting, wow. we with charcoal, pastels, all that stuff. Yeah. And, um, I could never get it to look the way that I wanted it to look. Mm-hmm. And, and so I basically quit making art after that. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. And that same year, around that same time, I won the school spelling bee and I was like, oh, this is, this is easy. Words are easy for me. I could do this. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I've done a bunch of different things. I got into music yeah. after that. No. Um, I, I would not, you called me a singer. I would not call myself a singer. Oh, oh I like, will call you a singer. Don't like you worry. Like any dude who learned how to play the guitar, I, you know, fake my way through, um, you know, some, some vocals if nobody else will do it. Um, Very cool. Played in some bands. Uh, I, I, for most of my sort of young adult life, I wanted to be a professional musician. Um, really? I wanted to per perform as a musician and I did briefly. Uh, yeah. For my a, a year out of college, I was a part of a, a touring group, and then I moved to Nashville and became eventually became a writer. That is super cool. So the connection here for those people just meeting you today is that you turned those songs you wrote into a book of poetry. So there is the connection between singing and writing, and of course lyrics and singing. It makes sense that it's writing. But tell me about that shift to the poetry, and what made you realize that, hey, I need to go this way instead of musician i need to go this way because it f did it feel better to you did it what was the drive to change and switch gears from musician well i actually started out writing poems um mm -hmm. uh when i was you know maybe in middle school mm -hmm. um i was always trying to find a, a mode of expression that that allowed me to address whatever I was feeling inside myself. Um, and, and so uh, I, I liked drawing, but I, I was not great at it or not as good as I wanted to be. And that was all, that's always been a frustration mm -hmm. of like, mm -hmm. once you get into something, you see what it takes to master and it become very discouraging. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I felt that way in almost everything I've ever done, uh, music, uh, art, uh, writing, um, and and I have great appreciation for all of the arts, um, but it's also sort of frustrating because I've dabbled in a lot of different things instead of yeah. really delve deep into mastery into a single one. 
Um, I, I, so I wrote poems in middle school and high school cause you know, girls wouldn't go out with me and, and that was my, <laughs> that was, that was how I processed yeah. those feelings was, was through poems. And so my, my poems actually became songs and I learned how to play guitar. My dad taught me how to play guitar and I, I started a, a group in high school and we just, you know, wrote grungy, you know, nice. kind of songs. Yes. Um, and that was it. I loved music. I loved, I loved playing music. I loved playing guitar. I loved performing. Um, in college, I was in a few different bands and, and I was like, if I could do this for a living, I totally would. I loved being on stage, um, mm -hmm. creating a song, you know, cause, mm -hmm. cause when you perform music, as you know, you are, um, every performance is unique. It is, it is yeah. not, it's never the same performance twice. Yeah. And so you are creating something live. Uh, and mm -hmm. speaking is that way too. Interviews are that way. There's there's a certain um, uh, number of of very improvisational forms, um, mm -hmm. and and I like those. I like the ones that are that are performative in nature, and mm -hmm. and require improvisation, require you to make mm -hmm. a decision on the fly. Because I think that is art. Uh, in some ways, I think that's art in its purest form. Is whatever you are able to come up with on the spot, right wow. now. Because even iteration, yeah. even rewriting, revising, yeah, is 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 just what you're able to do in the moment with whatever is kind of coming through you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I played music throughout all of college, and I wanted to be a professional musician. I was also studying Spanish and religion, uh, wow. because those were subjects that were interesting to me. And I, I was not, I was not trying to build a career off of this. I was just pursuing what. I thought was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and, and while I was in this, so then I graduated college and I ended up touring, uh, with a band for a year after college. Um, I was a good student. All my professors wanted me to go to grad school and I was like, I'm going to go travel with this band. And, nice. um, one of the things that I did that year was I kept a blog and I would write, mm -hmm. um, weekly updates about what was going on with the band. And, uh, if you've ever, you know, toured, um, or anybody who has, you know, that um, uh, to love music and to be a touring musician do not necessarily go together. No, they don't. No. Uh, and, and the touring life is obviously not for everybody. And I was yeah. the leader of our band. I drove our, our conversion van full of seven musicians pulling a, a trailer behind us full of equipment. You know, and then we drive eight to 12 hours a day from gig to gig to gig. And yeah, it's all, all over North America uh, mm -hmm. for about nine months. And then we we had a little stint in Taiwan for a month. And um, and most of that job was not playing music or writing music or, mm -hmm. um, you know, meeting fans or any of that. Most of that job was, um, uh, you know, driving from one place to the next, crashing uh, you know, in some crappy place, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, beautiful places, but, um, but it was like, it was just this grind of like, get up, drive, you yep. know, e eat a burrito at a Texaco and, oh, yes. and mm -hmm. you know, play an evening show, crash, get up early the next day and do it. All Repeat. Over. It was yeah. very, it was, it was not fun. No. I, I didn't, I, I no. there were fun parts of it, but I, I did not have fun. I was a 20, yeah. 24 year old young man in charge of people who were mostly younger than me. And I was in charge of like getting up 20 somethings who had come in right out of college. And, yeah. um, you know, there was no uh -huh. sense of personal discipline or anything. And we we're like, no. I, it forced me to grow up cause I, cause right. I had to be the grown up. And, um, and so my favorite part of that year of tutoring was writing, was writing these little Story Interesting. And blog so the dream started morphing a little bit here. I can sense that yeah. the writing kind of started piquing your interest a bit more. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's yeah. hard to say what, like which dream precedes which dream because yeah. I'd been writing my whole life. I'd yeah. always been, you know, great with words. Um, uh, you know, w when I was drawing, I was like in middle school, I was like drawing pictures and then, and then writing stories. And I like made my own little comic books and stuff, you know, like kids mm -hmm. stuff. My son does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so when writing kind of came back into my life, um, I was like, well, yeah, you know, I've, I've done this forever. And I, and being a musician, I was always writing, I was always writing music. Mm -hmm. Um, but I remember there was a conversation, um, 
where I had a I had a chat with a, a bass player friend of mine who was in another band, and um, he said, "Man, if I couldn't do this, if I couldn't play music for a living, I don't know what I'd do." And I remember immediately thinking, "I would just do something else." Interesting. And I was like, "Oh," and, and I like heard myself think that thought. Wow. And, and it was a little bit disturbing. And I was like, "Well, I, I, then maybe this isn't what I'm cut out to do." Um, uh, you mm -hmm. know, if this is a thing that I can live without then it's a good thing, but maybe it's yep. not what I would consider my calling. Wow. That's a real dose of honesty and getting really, you know, connected inside and being like, okay, what do I want? But what For is sure. it? Yeah. How, how, what does that look like now? Because that's a, you know, I've met a lot of musicians and a lot of them say, you know, I would just die if I wasn't <laughs> like, it would just be awful. And so yeah. those people that. keep going, keep going. Right. Yeah. Like, I get that. Insane. And, and, and yeah. I've written books about this and subscribe yeah. to the ideology of like purpose and yeah. um, calling and vocation. And yeah. um, I, I think it's a really unhealthy thing to say to yourself and to the world, this mm -hmm. is what I must do. And if I don't do this, I'm going to die. Exactly. Um, uh, I, I don't subscribe to that anymore. Um, Good. people sometimes ask me like, you know, if you couldn't be a writer, what would you be? Like, I consider that I think about, I would be yeah. something else, you know, I would find another outlet yeah. for my creativity yeah. as an, as an author and as somebody who, you know, helps people make books, uh, people ask me questions about AI and, and, and the technology of the book. Is it going to last? Is it going to be replaced by, you know, 20 second videos on the internet? And, and I, I don't like, I'm, I'm agnostic in terms of, um, uh, media. Like I don't, yeah. I don't need a certain medium to last nice. forever. The book is a technology. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a 500 year old technology. Um, mm -hmm. and it, and it might not last for, it probably won't last forever, wow. but human beings telling stories, yeah. creating art, sharing wisdom and knowledge in creative ways, we're going to keep finding ways to do that um, because it is something that intelligent beings do and it is an important part of how we sort of build on the accomplishments of the past and try to not repeat mm -hmm. our old mistakes. Wow. I love that this is a conversation of, you know, dropping the angst, embracing the ease and adaptability. <laughs> it's just like, it's cool, right? Life is good. Just keep going, right? I think that is a huge conversation for artists, for creatives to drop that, uh, I have to do it or I will die. Like that energy, <laughs> if you buy into energy, it's just not attractive. It's just not going to work for you. It's going to work against you. I well, and, and and that that creative energy, you know, the, the mm -hmm. spirit living inside of you, however mm -hmm. all that works, it's always looking for expression. Mm. Um, and, and if it can't find expression, that's when things get grows that's when they that's when lives turn dark yes. that's when you're like you, you know you get sick and diseased and and look i'm i'm, I'm not saying that you know just because you had the sniffles you're not finding a you know expression of your creativity <laughs> right but it does seem like it wants to go somewhere and yeah and it cares less about where it goes than you do but it needs mm -hmm. to go somewhere so mm -hmm. when i have like a really stressful day at work um i uh I, I, I pack up early. I did this, you know, last week I pack up early and, and I, and I finish up work at like four o'clock in the afternoon. I go to the grocery store, I buy a bunch of ingredients and I start cooking. I wondered if you were going to say this. Totally. Yes. Like, yes. Cause I've yep. got, cause I have to make something. I yep. have to make something that I've never made before and, um, and, and just kind of work it out. And, and this mm -hmm. I, I find is pretty common amongst a lot of uh, creative people I know that they have other outlets, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it might be painting. You know, if you're a musician, it might be painting. If you're a writer, it might be singing. And it's usually doing something that you're not great at. Mm. Um, and, and because if you're great at it, there's ego. And then there's like, I should I leverage yeah. this? Should I publish this? Should I sell yeah. it? You know, like, yeah. is it yeah. good enough? If I sit down and write an essay, that can be sort of a mode of expression, but it yeah. can also, I can also get in my head about it. If I'm, you know, making some chicken tikka, tikka masala for our family for dinner that night, it's like, it's, it's not art, you know, uh, but it right, is a right. creative act and mm -hmm. it kind of gets me out of my head. Um, and, and I, I guess a, a way of answering the original question is, I love it. 
um, you know, uh, I, I, I started writing professionally in about 2012. I very quickly turned that into a full-time career of writing, teaching, speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, I taught a bunch of online classes for a long time and, um, and then 2020 hit and, uh, I went through divorce. I went through an existential crisis. I didn't know who I was, what it all, what it all meant anymore. Um, and, and around that time, just to figure things out, I started writing poetry again, you know, which Love was it. something I'd done a long, long time, you know, as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, I didn't write um, uh, poetry for anybody. I wrote it for myself. It was a way to figure things out. And I started publishing some of them on Instagram when they would resonate with people. But it was, it was a way of me making sense of the world to myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved it. It's, it was easy. You know, it was like, yeah. you, can't, you can't write a book in an afternoon. You can write a poem in 20 minutes. And, mm-hmm. and usually, you know, if I spent a few days on it, it wouldn't get much better. And so the poem <laughs> would come to me, I would write it down and then move on. Songs can be that way too. They're sort yeah. of ephemeral. They kind of come, you write them down, you capture them and then you move on yeah. and they're, they're good or bad, but they're done. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I'd been writing poems, um, and sending them to the, uh, woman that I loved and, uh, who, you know, graciously decided to marry me last year. And, um, <gasps> uh, and then for, for Christmas, so we, we've been, we've been sending poems back and forth for years now. And it's so um, cute. I love it. And, um, and so then, and then to like, a a, a gift to her for, Christmas, <laughs> I put together some poems that I had written for her about her and, and, you know, during the time <laughs> we were getting to know each other. Uh, and I, I put them into a, a book that, that I, I saw that one on that Amazon. I published, I published mm-hmm. and I gave it to her and then I unpublished it so nobody else can have a copy. So it's a, Oh really? I thought I a, creeped on that and found it, but maybe I just found uh, mention I, of it. I, I think I unpublished it. I mean, maybe, maybe there's, maybe like, it's in I, Canada still. Shh, maybe, don't take it off. That's funny. No. Um, you know, what's, what's, um, uh, that what's funny about that. What's interesting about the, the world of publishing now is, is I wanted to give, like, I wanted to give a special book to my wife as a Christmas present. Aww. And the easiest and fastest way to do that was to just publish it directly to Amazon. Like wow. that was the, and, and print it on, like, and use print on demand technology. And I, I, like, I, I, uh, I've written books before. I've, our, our, our agency helps uh, authors produce books. So if you want help planning, writing, editing, and even designing and publishing a book, we can do all of that for or with you. Mm. Um, but this was like, uh, like I wanted to do everything. I wanted to design the cover. I wanted to lay out the interior design, typeset it, uh, all of it. And that was the uh, e- easiest and fastest way to give one person a single book was to sort of publish it for the world. And I left it up for a little while and then I decided this is just for her. I'm going to take it down. So Well, the, I absolutely the love the title. Like the title just made my heart sing. It was just so cute. So, um, wow, wow, wow. What a gift. I just think that that is, yeah, words are, words are a gift. And I love that you did this. So, um, you write about some huge concepts, accessible concepts, but huge concepts in your amazing, amazing books. But I want to take us back to that first line of your website. Stop being boring. How did this come to be the first line of your website? And how does this line up with your fabulous books? Um, One of the things I was struggling with, you know, I mentioned an existential crisis, like, you know, I don't know what it was, midlife crisis, you know, uh, deconstruction of all the ideas that I I once held dear. Um, uh, I just knew that at a certain point, my life no longer made sense to me anymore. Mm-hmm. And all of the things that I'd been striving for didn't seem that valuable anymore. Fame, money, uh, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it was a real struggle. And um, and I didn't know what to do with that. If, if you've ever experienced that, it's like, what do I do with this? Right. Um, and um, and uh, w- w- one week, uh, back in 2019, I guess, I was traveling um, – before the pandemic, obviously. And um, uh, I was down in Florida speaking at a college university that had, was had like a writing conference. And I came in and did a little talk there. Mm-hmm. And and I was visiting with a client um, uh, at the same time. And, and he quoted somebody else. 
Um, but he said he was talking about self-esteem and, and I was sitting with him hanging out and, and he said, um, and he could tell that I'd been going through some stuff personally and I didn't even know what it was at the time, but I, you know, we were just kind of talking and, um, he said, you know, self-esteem is, um, not telling yourself nice things about yourself. Self-esteem is living a life that is worthy of your own respect. Ooh. And, and wow. when he said that, I was just like, oh, yeah, that's what's been going on with me is I have my standard of what a well-lived life looks like. And then yeah. I have this thing called my life right. that I know I created on some level. And there was mm -hmm. a disparity between that, between what I consider to be a good life, a life that would be worthy of my respect and, and, and what in the one that I was living. Um, and, and, and so I was like, well, I don't like that, you know, like, let's get to work. Like, let's try to rebuild a life that, that I would look at and go, that's a pretty great life. Like, wow. you know, I mean, we all pretend that we don't judge people and we all do. So, you know, you look out the yeah, window, we do. And you look at your neighbors and your friends we and do. your relatives and whatever, and you go, you see some people and you go, oh, I, I like, like, I want what they have. Or you see other people, and yep. you go, that doesn't look great. Yep. And what you don't want to be is the kind of person that you would judge and go, that doesn't look like a great life. No. Um, now, no. now, now the judgment is false. It's silly because you don't really know what people's lives feel like. That may feel awesome to them, and that's great. Mm -hmm. But if you look at your life and you and you go, that's not the kind of life I'd like to be living. Well, you're in that life. You know what it feels like right. to be in it. Right. And so if it doesn't look good on the outside and it doesn't feel good on the inside, uh, you better change that. And, and the best way to make a life better is to not try to make it better, but to make it more interesting. Ooh, and okay. um, one of the things that, that we do in our agency, Fresh Complaint, is we help uh, authors primarily uh, make their work more interesting. Our promise to a client of ours is that we won't let you settle for a bad book. And it's nice. really easy to settle for a bad book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so how we're going to do this, we're going to make it interesting and interesting is, is any idea that challenges its audience's assumptions. Um, that's, what's interesting. That's what makes a song interesting. That's what makes a book compelling. It, it, it's what makes a story worth remembering is something that you expect to happen does not happen. Or, or something that you wouldn't expect to happen does happen. Obviously, this is this is the crux yeah. of any uh, great story. Is is something surprising has to happen at some point. Uh, hundred hundred years ago or so, ninety years ago, something like that. Um, uh, J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, who were good friends, uh, mm -hmm. were comparing their work. They're sharing their work with each other, and and Tolkien shared with Lewis um, uh, a book that he was at the time calling. Uh, the new Hobbit, and it was the sequel to his uh, best-selling novel, um, The Hobbit, and and it would eventually become The Lord of the Rings, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lewis reads it, and um, Tolkien asks him, "What do you think?" And and so they go out to lunch to discuss it, and and Tolkien uh, says to or uh, um, Lewis says to Tolkien, he says, "Tollers," he says, um, he said, uh, he said, the problem the problem with hobbits is that they're only interesting when you put them in unhobbit like circumstances. Nice. The problem with I remember hobbits, this. Yeah, is, is that they're only interesting when yeah. you put them in a place th that they're not accustomed to being in. A and that was um, Lewis's way of saying to Tolkien, like, you've got to move the story forward, man. Like, we can, I don't care. Like, if you've ever read Lord of the Rings or even seen the Peter Jackson movie. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's slow. It's, it's slow, and they spend a long time in the Shire before anything happens. Like and first, it's boring. Yeah, it's like Sorry. it's setting it's setting the stage. It's yeah. building the world. It's cool. Yeah, but, but we know that the story doesn't actually happen until these very comfortable creatures leave their very comfortable homes and go on an adventure. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true with your life. And so, if you want to yeah. be exceptional, you have to do exceptional things. If you mm -hmm. want to live an interesting story, you have to resist what feels normal. And normal is boring. Normal is expected. <laughs> and so you have to do uh, extraordinary things. And extraordinary things are not amazing things. They're just things that are not ordinary. If you've ever seen The Truman Show, there's a great yes. um, scene where you know he basically starts doing the opposite of what he does every single day. 
Mm -hmm. And, and he sort of starts waking up to the reality of his own life that he's been playing a character, um, in a, in a show and, and he doesn't know that, but there's something inside of him that is sort of gnawing at him. And we all have this feeling, you know, like there's like, there is a deeper, broader, more expansive life that we know we're capable of living. And we also know that we're falling short in some ways. Uh, mm -hmm. or work that we could be doing that is that is better, deeper, purer, truer than we are otherwise doing. And, mm -hmm. and the best way to begin to lean into that is to turn left when you would normally go right, you know, to take a different way mm -hmm. home, uh, to yeah. to break your routine in some way on purpose mm -hmm. for the sake of kind of like shaking up the programming a little bit. And mm -hmm. what that does is it actually kind of wakes up your soul a little bit. You notice things that you wouldn't otherwise notice. You know, we, yeah. we live in this world where everybody's like crazy about habits and stuff and routines and, and it's fine. It's cool. But like that's that's not what it means to be human, to do the same thing the same way every single day ad infinitum. That's that's not how you live. No. Now, it is being sort of extolled as a virtue um, mm -hmm. on the Internet right now. But I've lived that way, um, and, yeah. and you know, and plenty of people have. Um, there is something uh, helpful and useful about um, commitments, disciplines, and mm -hmm. and habits. Uh, but in and of themselves, they're not laudable. Um, mm -hmm. They're traps that that can get you to sort of fall asleep. And if any, if you've ever been yes. you know, struck by inspiration and written a song or a poem or or come up with a melody or or just you know written something down that that felt really beautiful and compelling, you go, where'd that come from? I wasn't even expecting that. Yes. Well, that comes from the same place that all great things come from, and and that place is not boring. And so Not your right. one job as an artist, as a creator, as a whatever you want to call it, a person who makes things is to not be boring because boring people make boring stuff. And if yep. you're making boring stuff, stop being boring. <laughs> Shake up the programming. Change your life in some small way. Look, I'm it. not talking about selling your house and moving to India and, mm -hmm. and, and joining the monks. You can do that. That's wonderful. But that's usually mm -hmm. not the first step. The first step mm -hmm. is – do something a little bit differently than you would normally do. Mm -hmm. and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually tried this with a very small thing. Yeah. I've never been a morning person because I'm a rock star. So I'm up late yeah. at night and I sleep in, but I've started getting up early yeah. and giving myself time first thing in my day for my creative projects. Well, holy shit. Did that not change my whole things are just flowing. Yes. The first week sucked. I'm not going to lie. I did, was like, Oh, the alarm. But then I remembered, okay, what well, I'm, I'm going to get to do fun things. This is actually pretty awesome and no one needs anything from me. And it really shook up the system. So I'm right there with you on that. That is awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's true. Anything is true. And we turn, we turn these sort of things into like a dogma. Like I have to do this this way every single day for the rest of my life. Well, now you've created a new program and that's fine. I mean, yeah. we need programs. Mm -hmm. but when you become a slave to the program and, and you forget that you're the one who created it, <laughs> then you sort of fall back asleep to your own life. And so oh. one of the ways that we keep waking up is we keep trying different things for our whole lives. We should do this. Learn yeah. new things. Uh, yeah. you know, I've never been this kind of person. Try it. Do do something a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and and because what it does is it just it's like little ping pricks in your um, uh, in your in your consciousness. And yeah. it's like you see things that you wouldn't otherwise see. You feel mm -hmm. things that you other otherwise wouldn't feel. You notice uh, things that you might otherwise not notice. And part of the job. Uh, really the only job of an artist is to notice things and bring our attention to them. And all I'm ever trying to do as a writer is like point out the world and go, does anybody else see this? This is, <laughs> this is weird or amazing or beautiful or terrible. But like, do you guys see this? And in yeah. order to do that, I not only have to stay awake, I have to sort of keep waking up. I have to oh keep becoming more conscious so that I can notice more things and try to bring some expression to those things. At least wow. I hope to do that. Well, I think you're doing it brilliantly. And you just answered my next question. The tie between your art or your creations and personal transformation. And I think you just said, you know, staying awake. Um, is there anything else you want to add to that conversation? Because you've written some pretty profound books that dispel a lot of myths that people are routinely, habitually living. Uh, one of them is Real Artists Don't Starve. 
Right. Um, that that's what grabbed my attention in the first place. That's how I found you. I was like, holy snarkies. Like what? Someone's actually saying this out loud. This is amazing. Is this, but is it true? Because we've all been taught that it's, you know, you, you it's hard to make it in music. It's hard right. to make it in art. It's hard yeah. to whatever, whatever the voices are. So yeah, over to you. I'm, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on this whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I think transformation, transformation means to change form, to change shape shape mm -hmm. to become something uh, else. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why I'm hesitant to say, this is my dream and I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And if I don't do this, I would just die. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I'm hesitant to say that is because uh, my job description keeps changing. And, and I have ended up in a life and in a work mm -hmm. that 20 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to predict and wouldn't have believed if somebody told me. And wow. so- I probably will be doing something radically different or in different ways uh, that I'm doing now than I will be, you know, 20 years from now. Um, uh, so, so I write books. Um, I write anything in part to sort of like take snapshots of the journey. Here's where I'm at right now. Here's what mm -hmm. seems true to me right now, and and here's how I've changed since the last time I've I've noticed something. And Real Artists Don't Starve um, was, was me having an experience of being a full-time writer, doing this thing that I personally never thought was possible. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a traveling musician, we stayed in people's homes. Um, and, and so we would stay in trailers, we would stay in mansions, you know, like we, we, we stayed in college dorm rooms. Sometimes we'd crash in a hotel, but for the most part, people would put us up in their homes. And I remember we were in like, Montana or something. And we were, um, we weren't playing any shows that week, but we were staying with this family that we'd met and, and they were really nice house kind of out in rural Montana. We stayed there for a few days. Uh, they treated us really well, took care of us. It was a nice little respite. And, and one morning I'd gotten up early and I was chatting with the, 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 the matriarch and, um, and she was asking me questions about where we'd been, what we'd done, you know, we were all, you know, young 20 somethings. Yeah. Um, and she said, it's really good that you're doing this now while you're young, because when you get older, you won't be able to do this. And I said, yeah, totally. You know, we're just doing this for, you know, a year or so and, and we'll move on to other things and get jobs and stuff. Like I agreed with her. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have any, uh, mm -hmm. ideas that I would do this for the rest of my life. It was a nice thing to do before I had to grow up. And, and sure enough, wow. I did, you know, I went and got a job and got yeah. married and had kids yeah. and bought a house and, you know, seven years into that life, this other part of me started waking back up, but bubbling up going, Hey, what about like all this creative stuff that you used to do? You know, wow. I was a marketing director at a nonprofit who loved to write, but I was doing, and I was doing creative ish work as a marketer, but I wasn't doing what I, what my soul was longing for. And, um, what I do know about creative people is like that thing that's, that's inside of you that bubbles up every once in a while, early in the morning, late at night that says, Hey, mm -hmm. there, there's, you're not, you're not doing it. You're not mm -hmm. doing the thing that you know mm -hmm. that you need to do. That doesn't go away. Uh, no, at least never, not in my never, experience. And the more never. you push it down, the more it kind of rears its ugly head. So try to listen to that. That's a good idea. I love um, that. And it wants expression. You know, it's, it wants to be expressed in activity in some way. And, and that expression probably doesn't look exactly the way that you, th you think it will look. Um, so, re so, I, so I end up doing it, you know, and I write books and start a blog and, and become um, uh, a full-time author. And, and, I, and I still, and I meet writers all the time to this day who are mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, I could never do that. Right. They're, they're telling, wow. they're telling me the same story that that woman told me that I agreed with, you know, a decade before about yeah. music. Yeah. And I live in Nashville. So I'm well acquainted with the fact that there are people who are making it and there are people who are struggling. Um, but I, I have, a, I have a lot of friends who are full-time successful musicians who aren't famous, mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. whose, whose songs are not on the yep. radio, as you know, you know, like there's yep. lots of different ways to make a living as a musician mm -hmm. these days. And and so, you know, I kept bumping into people who would basically tell me what they thought was pos possible based on their own experience. And, and I would meet what I would now call a thriving artist, you know, a musician or a writer or a visual artist or a photographer 
um, who was was making a good living, which was usually like a multi six figure income, taking care of their family, running their own business, um, you know, making their art, but also like having some commercial aspect to it as well. And they were great. They were happy. They were they were doing their work. And then mm -hmm. I would also meet people that were struggling and starving and really frustrated and like couldn't catch a break and just hustling and just couldn't break through. And when I looked at these two groups of people, you know, I, like you got the starving artist and you got the 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 thriving artist. They were both pretty good. Like the person yeah. who was making it wasn't like 10 times better or even twice as good as an artist as the one who was struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they knew the right people and they'd made the right connections and they'd made the right choices and they'd been lucky, um, which I think is a thing, you know, like mm -hmm. certain that you bump into people at a coffee shop and it turns into a thing. That's, that's luck. Um, but like they were kind of just as smart, just as capable as the people who were struggling. Um, mm -hmm. But the struggling people were really sort of wrapped up in their own narrative about what was possible. Yes. And and writers I found were especially this way, you know, where where I would say, Oh, you just have to do this, this, and this. And you, you know, you could, you could, you could become a, a full-time successful author as well. Um, or at least, you know, give it a try. And they go, Oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Oh, you know, like, and they would they would sort of talk themselves out of it. And I was like, This is weird, you know, like <laughs> that that the that the, the differentiator is not talent. Yeah. No. Uh, it's not skill. It's no. not even luck. It's a uh, mindset. It's, it's what you're, yes. what yeah. you're willing to believe and accept about reality. Yeah. And, and so, you know, this kind of, like I was thinking about this and wanting to write a book about creative success. And then uh, a friend of mine who had just honeymooned in Florence, Italy with his wife came back telling me about th this this tour guide had told him about all these uh houses that they'd visited that were that belonged to the artist michelangelo and, oh, wow. and and my friend was like what are you talking about michelangelo was an artist and they're like yeah he was rich he was so rich he, he owns right. all this land throughout Italy. <laughs> and and so long story short you know he he sent me an article his name is joe he's a good friend of mine and i started reading all of this research and connected with the original um uh, professor in uh, Florence who basically discovered that Michelangelo had all these unknown bank accounts that were that 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 um, like he was hiding money basically like he mm -hmm. was like a like a wealthy person today might <laughs> do you know he's like oh, yeah. unnamed bank accounts <laughs> anyway um, uh, uh, what what he found what the what the researcher found is guy his name is Rab Hatfield he's still alive today Professor Rab Hatfield uh, he found that Michelangelo had almost $50 million to his name when he died. He was the Good richest Lord. artist of the Renaissance. And at that point, the richest, richest artist who had ever lived. And, and that got me thinking, I was like, okay, if, if inarguably one of the greatest artists of all time um, was uh, ridiculously wealthy, mm -hmm. then this narrative uh, mm -hmm. that, that we're subscribed to about, about the starving artist that, that, to that, that you've got to starve and struggle to really make honest, beautiful art. If he was doing it and making a living and he, and he hadn't sold out, because that's sort of the, the, the dichotomy. It's that's like, the other side of it. You well, either, you must have sold you out, sell out and create junk, you know, for the masses, or you struggle to create real art, you know? Oh, boy. And I said, well, here's Michelangelo, who's, yeah. um, you know, uh, on his back painting the Sistine Chapel, getting paid a million dollars. To, to paint the Sistine Chapel, who at the end of his life had a 40 year commission of building a cathedral where he had 400 people who were working under him. He was a CEO. Um, wow. He was a very entrepreneurial, intrepid, um, uh, shrewd businessman. <laughs> and, and all I wanted to explore was like, are there other people like this throughout history? And there are, there, there are lots of thriving yeah. artists. And so the whole point of that book was well first of all you know i'd found a way to sort of cobble together a career around writing in a way that made me you know relatively happy made me a lot of money and, and allowed me to do the thing that i loved doing far more than like working at a bank would and so yeah. i made this change could other people make this change well i looked around at the world and i saw lots of people who who were doing this and had done this and I came to the conclusion, you know, uh, are there starving artists in the world? You bet. But being a starving yeah. artist today is a choice, not a necessary condition of doing creative oh. work. 
Preach. And there's lots and lots of stories to yeah. to back that up. Um, and so I, you know, I, I continue to 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 do that, to have experiences mm -hmm. um, in my life and go, you know, is is it just me or or have other people experienced this as well? And then mm -hmm. how can I tell stories and share ideas in a way that invites other people into a transformation they may want to experience? Um, wow. So yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to don't be boring. So yes. I have to keep changing. Yes. I have to keep growing. I yes. have to keep sort of testing the borders and boundaries of this thing mm -hmm. called my life. Mm -hmm. And then and then tell people about it. And, and I do think that artists are required to do this. Is they're required yes. to store, sort of stand on the edge between the known and the unknown. Um, you know, the, the real world and, and the fantasy world. You know, wow. and, and we have, and we see this in lots of mythology. We see this in lots of stories. You've got Alice in Wonderland. You've got the Wizard of Oz. Uh, you know, there's th this is this mm -hmm. is kind of the Joseph Campbell uh, hero's yes. journey, where you have the yeah. known world and the unknown world, and mm -hmm. uh, the hero always has to leave the known world, what they know, that their set of routines and, and traditions, that to leave the known world to experience the unknown world, and when they go out into the unknown world they discover something and that something that they discover is not out in the world, it's in themselves. And so then when they come back, the point, the end of the hero's journey is you come back uh, from your adventure, you come back to the known world uh, with a gift and you bring that gift back to the known world and, and you share it and you go on this journey many, many times throughout your life. Um, and, and so the creative journey is, is one of going out into the unknown. Mm-hmm delving deep inside of yourself, grabbing something from that, you know, from that ooze out there, however that works, and then, <laughs> and then coming back to the real world and telling us about it and telling us about it in the form of a song wow. or a book or a podcast. Wow. But, but that's the job of the artist. That has always been the job of the artist. And and the problem is is recently we've been sold, uh, you know, and I like, we've been sold a bill of goods about like fame and and mm -hmm. you know, even money. I, you know, like these these are these are means to an end. They are not the end. Yeah. And and social media is is kind of to blame for this and just kind it's of like current pop culture. It, it's it, yeah. it's these are means that they're necessary. They're mechanisms, yeah. but they're not the 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 ideal destination. They're just kind of the, the mm -hmm. way that you get there. Your job mm -hmm. is to do weird stuff, discover <laughs> weird things and tell us about it in ways yes. that we might hopefully believe it's true for ourselves as well. And that's transformation. Oh my gosh. You're, you're just fabulous. And I love that you're doing all of this good stuff. So I'm going to show people where they can find more about you. Goinswriter.com. You can visit them online. We actually have a question. So we have a couple minutes. We're going to give you, yeah, you saw that. Okay. This one ties the voice and the writing together brilliantly it's from it's from my husband downstairs <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's also equally obsessed with your books uh, um jeff i'm curious to know how voicing your audiobook impacts the whole process for you are there deeper lessons you learn from having to voice the book once you're finished writing it so I think that's a great that's a great so uh, question um because because writing a book is not the same thing as reading it aloud and it's a different yeah. experience um uh, I, I've I've read almost all of my books. There was one situation where I couldn't couldn't read it myself because of a family thing, and somebody else had to do it, which was unfortunate. Um, but um, first of all, when I read my book out loud, you know, narrating an audio book, th there are moments where I go, "Did I write that?" Nice. Like <gasps> often, and and wow. and sometimes, and it's it's always positive like i'm like did i write that that's pretty good i like that wow i'm you know i'm experiencing it differently um i very rarely regret anything um mm -hmm. which which i think is sort of un that that is unusual of me yeah. i'm always trying to make it better and better and better and better and better um uh once i once i read a book aloud as, as like an audiobook i don't read it again uh, like i'm not really? pulling, i'm not pulling my my books off of the shelves reading them again Oh, uh, I'll do that for you. Yeah. I, it's, <laughs> I'll, I'll it's, reread them. It's done. I made it and I've moved yeah. on and I'm happy that you're happy with it. Yeah. But now I'm trying to do something else. I'm trying to figure out something else out. I may pull Love something it. out and like do a reading or share something with somebody, mm -hmm. but I don't read my own books. That's not why I wrote them, you know? <laughs> uh, so when I narrate an audiobook, I am sort of reading my book for the last time. Wow. And, and, and it is, 
it is sort of a, a ritual in that sense where I'm, and I, this wasn't conscious. It wasn't like intentional initially, but it yeah. is like, that's what it's become is like, I'm closing the chapter on this. You know, I'm, I'm capturing it one last time and I'm moving on. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the same way that I can listen to myself answering your questions going, where are those words coming from? There's a part of me who's listening to myself say these things. Yeah. When I read an audio book or read my own work, I go, I, I don't know where that came from. Interesting. And, 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 and there is, um, I, I think that's beautiful. You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Dylan said, uh, he, he doesn't even know who the person was who wrote blowing in the wind. Like it just came <sighs> through him. It just came. Yeah. Alanis Morissette and, talks about that all the time. She just channels songs. She's like yeah. 20 minutes. It was done. What? Yeah. You, yeah. It's just, like it's, it's, it's a thing that wants to mm -hmm. kind of come through you. Liz Gilbert calls it yeah. big magic. Yes. Yes. It's true. There is something sort of transcendent about it. And and certainly there are times where it's just like pounding out the words, but there are times where it, it just seems to come. And I forget about those times until I sit down and read a book that I've written and go, that was special. That was a cool moment. I remember where I was, what I was thinking, um, mm -hmm. who, who I was, who I was with at that time when I wrote that. And it's nice to remember that person that I no longer am, but appreciate. Wow. Brilliant. You are right on time. That was the best way to end this show. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I am just thrilled beyond thrilled. This is a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I hope people digest every single word and really go internal, uh, go internally and just ask yourself those questions. Are you settling for stuff? What are you feeling good? Then, you know, we got to get honest. That's the artist journey. We got to get honest, the creative's journey. Um, so thank you again, Jeff. And I want to be mindful of your time. It is the hour. So thank you. It's thank my you, pleasure. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Oh, I don't want him to go. Bye, Jeff. Um, wasn't that fun? I just, I could sit and talk with him all day and um, I should have maybe booked it for all day, but I didn't. But thank you for watching. I so appreciate you always tuning in and the likes and the subscribes that we get. It's just, it makes my heart sing. I said it before, I'll say it again. So um, if you want to find out more about us, YouTube is the most up-to-date place with all the scheduling. So um, November 6th, I believe, is the next show with Allison Davies. Um, she is phenomenal. She is a music therapist who is taking that conversation to the next level talking a little bit about trauma and voice and how that all comes together and yes if you're sick of the word trauma i'm sorry but yes it is a thing and it is working with or against your voice just saying so you'll want to tune in and find out more about that um, you can find us on facebook voxana.co or online voxana.co.co whatever you want to say um, and yeah until next time keep, I almost said, keep fit and have fun again. This is a co commercial from my childhood where it was about being active. So yes, keep vocally fit and have friggin' fun because that's the point. All right. Take care, everybody. Enjoy yourselves. And I'm still not good at this producing thing, but here we go. Here we go. We're almost there. <laughs> Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time.